Um, so I'm Patrick Cito, I'm on. Nice to meet you. Please take a seat, actually, if you sit there. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, Make yourself comfortable. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for coming. We thought we'd start by asking you what your specific interests are in the classics and why classics is something you want to pursue here. So I have a real interest in uh, epic poetry, um, something I wrote about in my personal statement. Um, I am really intrigued by the language. Um, I love studying Latin and Greek at A-level. Um, and I really want to explore more about epic poetry and that's really what drew me here. Great, okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I was very interested by your personal statement and I, <coughs> I noticed that you um, had had a very uh, interesting time excavating at Vindolanda. Just tell me a little bit more about that. How did that impact on, on the on the interest that you already had in the ancient world? So I was, obviously I love the language and I love the literature, but I really wanted to explore um, a bit more about the, the classical world um, and excavating at Vindolanda was one way I could do that. Um, I found it so fascinating. It was just a completely different experience to being in the classroom. Um, I felt so much more involved. Um, and really getting to discover, um, you know, piece, straps of leather from thousands of years ago is really just a completely different experience. It's something that I really relish in um, complementing the work that I'd already done in school. So, given that this is a highly text-based course, mm -hmm. do you think that's an important basis for something that you might like to do afterwards that includes archaeological work? Because it is very different, and I mean, this is not a course where we do digging or archaeological material remains. Absolutely. I think my, my passion is so deeply within the text but actually having that experience of archaeology helps me, like, informs me about texts and so actually it gives me a bit of a different perspective on how I approach those texts because of this knowledge. Um, I don't necessarily want to become an archaeologist, it's not something that I think I'm particularly talented at, um, but I think it's, it's another way that I can become a bit more well-rounded classicist because mm. I've got this different side to me. Um, brings it to life for you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We could just turn to the, the, the poem. Have you seen this poem before? Um, I I know that it's where Carpe Diem originates from, but I haven't, yeah, I haven't read it before. So you've heard of it, but not studied it. So uh, we wondered, would you like just to read out the English, um, just to focus all our minds on it? Mm -hmm. Don't ask, we may not know, you, Conway, um, what the gods plan for you or me. Leave the Chaldees to pass the sentence of the stars. Better to bear the outcome, good or bad, whether Jove purposes to add fresh winters to the past, or to make this the last which now tires out the Tuscan sea and mocks its strength with barricades of rocks. Be wise, strain clear the wine and prune the rambling vine of expectation. Life's short. Even while we talk, time, hateful, runs a mile. Don't trust tomorrow's bow for fruit. Pluck this here now. Very well read. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was some um, Horace. Horace addresses a woman, Leuconoe, um, and I don't know whether you've made any kind of picture of her from just from the poem. But does it matter who is addressed by whom? I think it does because. I think the fact that, A, he's talking to a woman, I think that's incredibly um, influential. I, I mean, I don't know how often that's an occurrence in Horace, but I think it's quite startling um, that women's even mentioned in uh, ancient literature. Um, but also, to, some, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter that much because I don't think the content of what Horace is saying would be much different if it was anybody else. Um, okay, yeah. and, and, and uh, what do you think the relationship might be between um, Horace and Leuconoe? Um, well, 
I don't think it's um, any sort of romantic relationship. Um, it seems very much um, once on an intellectual level. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a sort of general advice, you think, this poem? Yeah, to a certain extent, even philosophical, which... Philosophical. Um, but addressed to a woman... Yeah. ...who is what, who was, I mean, takes in the second question, really, but who's trying to use the stars, the sentence of the stars, what does that refer to? Um, well, I think it refers to some sort of astrological um, yes. study. So she's using astrology mm -hmm. to ask um, what the gods plan for you or me. Um, there's some implication there of a relationship or not? I think there's an implication of a relationship between the two, but I don't think that relationship is one that's incredibly close. It could simply be a friendship, it could simply be um, that they're just acquaintances. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about the, um, uh, what does the name economy suggest to you? Um, it sounds very Eastern. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, I mean, it's not a Latin name that I've ever heard before. No, so it, it, if I said it was a Greek name, meaning white mind, mm -hmm. literally, do you think that would give us any indication of the kind of woman that Horace is addressing? To my mind, the first thing that you said was um, some sort of priestess or someone who is in some way an intellectual because to me like the, I don't know white like, mm. I'm just thinking of purity and I'm thinking mm -hmm. of minds and some kind of but in my mind she has status within Greece. And do you think that's uh, it's interesting that you, you mentioned at the beginning that you were very surprised to find a woman being mentioned mm -hmm. um, in a poem. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering how much your sense of who this woman might be and what status she might have um, proceeds from your own sense of surprise at her being there at all. I think my surprise is to do with the fact that she's mentioned in a poem that isn't uh, to do, it, it is an elegy, it isn't. Um, she, she, to me, she doesn't occupy the same role as like some like Lesbia in Catullus, okay. mm -hmm. um, and so I would immediately just associate her from that um, sphere. So I would think that she has some status in society. Right. Okay. okay. So how do we? How should we understand the image of the sea and rocks? Do you think the the winters which now tires out the Tuscan sea and mocks its strength with barricades of rocks. What's going on there, this image? Well, I mean, it's incredibly vivid. Um, it certainly shows a lot about the harshness of, of winter. Um, and but, but why put it in at all? So he could have said, we don't know whether this is the last winter that we're going to have. But then he, he elaborates by saying, you know, the winter which tires out the Tuscan Sea. Well, I think this, this just follows um, the sentence where he says, bear the outcome, good or bad. Right. So I think there's, there's certainly a sense of putting up with the grievances of life. And I think that image of the sea um, the, the winter tiring out the sea and the, the barricades of rocks, so there's a real sense of how much effort um, and difficulty it is to, to get through a winter perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that certainly goes with the, the sense of bearing that outcome. Um, right, well that's interesting because the next question is, well, I'm going to skip one. Is the advice to bear the outcome, good or bad, consistent with the advice at the end? Pluck this here now. 
So that's what it says in the English, bear the outcome, good or bad. And it's then elaborated as far as you're concerned with this sort of difficulties that you get in winter. But in, in the Latin, if you look at it, it says quid quiderit pati, mm -hmm. uh, better to suffer whatever will be. Um, but assuming that the translator's got it right, and it means bear the outcome, does that really work? Is it compatible with pluck the day? I don't think so, because um, I know that carpe diem is very much associated with the Epicurean school of philosophy, whereas I would associate you know, so it's better to suffer whatever there is, or bearing the, the outcome, good or bad, with stoicism. And to me, those two schools of philosophy don't quite match up, and there seems to be some sort of discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you're right about that, and I think that actually, as a translator, has added in bearing the outcome, good or bad, and that perhaps melius quid quid erit petty in Latin should just be it's better to accept what happens mm -hmm. rather than this idea of bearing it in a, as you say, stoic fashion. So I'll skip the middle question. Should we go on? Yes, to that I one? just wanted to ask you about what you thought about um, if, we, if we if we go to the the um, towards the end of the poem. Um, where we have the metaphor um, of not trusting uh, tomorrow's bow for fruit, which the translator has put in. Um, but of course that's not uh, a literal translation of the Latin. He's added it, hasn't he? Um, why do you think he would have done that? Well, I think it's, I think it's quite a nice translation and a nice mm -hmm. rendering of uh, the Latin. Um, and certainly if you're reading it in English, it goes quite well with the imagery in the previous uh, stanza about wine and vines and I think it makes it more vivid for, for someone reading purely in English to understand um, mm -hmm. the sense of not trusting tomorrow um, that is conveyed within the Latin but I, I don't know, I, I don't really think there's a reason there's a reason other than poetic license. Well, let's think about the, 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 the Latin, and, and uh, you may or may not know this, but, but um, carpe, diem, carpe, is, carpe diem is often translated in English, isn't it, as seize the day. Mm -hmm. But of course, what it really means it is pluck. Yeah. pluck um, which the translator has put in uh, in the final line. He's used the word pluck. So perhaps that's the reason why he wanted to elaborate on the imagery, on, on the cultural imagery, mm -hmm. do you think that might be a reason? Yeah, I certainly think so. Um, I mean, it makes it, it manages to convey that sense of plucking much, much better than seizing, I think. Um, What's the difference? I think there's a sense of it being much more specific when you pluck something. Um, to me, there's there's almost a sense of resistance when you're plucking something, um, whereas seizing can be a bit violent, perhaps even um, it can be a bit too generic. Um, yes, and the idea of enjoyment, perhaps actually choosing what you're taking, mm -hmm. sense of being really engaged with the thing that you're trying to enjoy, rather than just having having your way with it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's... Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, Come on. Um, so yes, don't trust tomorrow's bar for fruit um, is an elaboration, of course, of, of credula postero. Uh, don't be too credulous in tomorrow. Um, so clearly is an, an elaboration of, of the original, but do you think it works to suggest that somehow tomorrow's bar may be barren to enjoy what you can get from it now because that's what i read i don't know whether you think that's right trust tomorrow's bow for fruit i mean i think there's the implication that it, it 
could be barren, but I think there's, to me, I get the sense of don't place all your hope on what is to come. Um, I mean, that could, yeah, it does go hand in hand with the potential that there could be nothing. Um, yeah, I think there's there's something to be said for not placing all of your hope and emotion on something that could be void. Um, in this case, it's the future. Yeah, which is interesting. In um, uh, Robert Frost wrote a poem called Carpe Diem, uh, in which he actually says that this this theme of um, of a, an interest in, in uh, plucking today's fruit belongs to age um, and that for um, when you're perhaps earlier in your life um, the present is is too confusing too crowd he, he says too crowding too crowding too confusing too present to imagine so he sees this very much as a, a theme um, of an older author and it's often thought that um, the economy, in fact, is, is much younger than, than isn't it, in, in, the, in the poem, is much younger than Horace. And so I just wondered, you know, does that seem like a, an analysis you, you um, would agree with or, or not? I think so. I think it could be a valid interpretation because there could almost be a sense of Horace giving the economy advice mm. or um, as you you know, grows older. Um, but he's starting off with advice by saying, don't consult astrology to find out what our end will be. Mm -hmm. So that's the main advice he's giving. Um, somehow she's interested in what Venus, what end, is given to me and to you. That's what, what he says. So it feels quite specific, as if they are... Mm -hmm. um, actually reacting to a specific action on her part. And are they looking out at the ocean and you know, is, 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 that, is there a sense of place or do you think, because we start off, and I'm not saying I don't disagree, mm. I, mean, I, I think the um, sense is that this is about generalities, but the more one looks at it, the more one finds very specific elements. The economy has been asking about the future, He's saying, don't bother to do that. Then we're looking at this sea scene where the winds are lashing the ocean against the rocks. And he says, if you're wise, you will just enjoy wine and forget about the future. So it could be general, it could be specific. I don't know, you still feel that it's, it's the general uh, Epicurean advice that he's trying to impart? I do still feel that way, but I just think that he uses specific examples to illustrate mm -hmm. his um, his main message. Um, it may be that he is with Yukonri as she's asking mm -hmm. what the gods plan, and actually his way of illustrating um, his philosophy is using, again, these specific uh, examples that will help her to um, to realise what he's saying. Right, so your answer to the last question, is it meant to be taken as serious for the advice, is, is yes, more or less. To her, I think, potentially. But as a, just as a reader of the poem, I don't think so at all. Right. Um, again, there's that, that, there's that discrepancy between um, the elements of Stoicism and Epicureanism that I don't think quite marry up, and I don't think I, th I think if it was if it was written as a philosophical poem, there would be slightly more regularity in mm. in what Horace has written. Um, Perhaps it's a bit over imagistic. Is that what you mean? Is a lot of Poetic. Yeah. So it's, not a serious, it's not being written as a serious philosophical poem, but mm -hmm. just someone trying to make sense of life and yeah. drawing on different elements. Yeah.
Yeah, and I think Horace has capitalised on the poetic um, ability that he has yeah. to illustrate his message. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, yes. Have you any questions for us? I don't think so. Either about this or about anything else. Um, oh, I did actually have a question about the Chaldees. Mm -hmm. Right. Because are they something to do with the... I just couldn't work out what, who they were supposed to be. Right, yeah. so the word is Babylonians in yeah. Latin, Babylonians. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the names for Babylonians you get in the Bible, Ur of the Chaldees, if you come across that. No, okay, that was in Babylonia, so for the poet, for the translator's purposes, it fitted to use that rather than the rather long word Babylonians in that line. Let's see anything. Well, so. The reference is to is to Babylonian astrology, okay. and she's been obviously been casting numbers and trying to actually get some answers to her questions about the future. Good, well, thank you very much for coming. It's very nice to see you. Thank, thank you. you. I thought, I thought she did very well in sticking to her guns um, on a couple of things where um, perhaps we were suggesting there might be you know different way of thinking about things. But she stuck to what she thought, but not blindly. She she um, um, she gave reasons for her her responses, and um, she was very clear at the end um, that uh, about what she thought about the. Uh, whether it was serious philosophical advice or not, she answered that um, very clearly and confidently. And I thought um, what she also showed was the ability to take a bit of time to think about the question, yeah. to genuinely engage with the poem. And I actually like the fact, we don't always get it, the question at the end, specifically about something that she was uh, simply just didn't know the answer to and wanted to know. So a kind of curiosity. She showed a curiosity and ability to just, you know, try and engage with the material and not to just give up easily when challenged to uh, ask what, to, to answer what the poem might be about, to come up with suggestions and to think about it with us, and as Melinda says, not to necessarily just give in to uh, suggestions we were making. She also gave us some very interesting ideas. I mean, we always find when we yes. talk to students about um, these poems that they give us very interesting ideas. Mm. And uh, the idea that Luke Connery might be thought of as a, a priestess yeah. was an, a, a new idea for me and I thought very interesting. We look for um, a series of different things. Um, we actually have a piece of paper which we then grade them on afterwards. Uh, motivation, aptitude, um, articulacy. Um, essentially, we're looking for potential. So, um, knowledge is one thing which they're expected to have up to a certain degree, but not for the specific thing we will be asking. So, with any luck, they won't have seen the poem or passage that we present. But the ability to think about it, to show intelligent imagination, and to show some aptitude for literature and language, because that's what we'll be doing for four years if they get in. Yes, and I would add to that that um, we're looking at that in the context of the overall application. So um, the performance in the interview will be set alongside uh, written performance uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the translation test that they've had, and uh, what they've uh, said in the application form and what has been predicted for their grades. So it's all, it's all part of a picture. It's also something about intellectual stamina, very hard to gauge in a 25 minute interview. But you're going to have to be doing this for four years if you get into read classics. So we need to feel that a candidate is keen on the subject, is prepared to spend some time and thought thinking about even a tiny sentence or a phrase and a sense that they won't just give up easily, um, that they have that kind of lasting staying power. Well, it doesn't matter, no, if you don't know Greek or Latin, they can be taught here. 
uh, and some students uh, arrive with no Latin or Greek and choose to learn one language, some choose to learn both, which is hard work but can be done. Um, and then some students arrive having done Latin uh, and Greek A-level. Those who have done Latin and Greek A-level, we are looking for a strong performance in the language tests, which are translation of unseen passages. Um, those who have not done the languages before uh, are asked to take a language aptitude test, where they are given some simulated, um, some simulated questions to see how they would respond to learning a language that is structured in the sort of way that Latin and Greek are. So it would be helpful for candidates for these uh, courses to have a strong linguistic aptitude, and that's what the linguistic aptitude test uh, aims to examine. But it also suggests that if they've already done some French or Italian or Spanish uh, for A-level, certainly for GCSE, that they are more inclined to be linguistically adept and uh, that's important. Yes, but uh, I would add to that not exclusively. I mean, there, there are because there are people these days now that schools don't require um, a, a modern foreign language to be done for GCSE, which used to be the case, and it's not required anymore. So there will be people who, through no fault of their own, have never studied a language, and the language aptitude test is designed to find out what their aptitude is for learning a language. Um, I think it went okay, I was quite nervous, um, but, and it was a bit, it's a bit daunting to be confronted with a poem that you've never really seen before, um, but having some questions to kind of structure um, was really helpful because then I could kind of order my thoughts instead of just being overwhelmed by uh, a Latin poem, um, and it was quite nice to start with a bit about my personal statement because I was quite comfortable talking about that because it's something that I've written. Um, it's a nice way to like settle me in, but I hope that it went okay. <laughs> and um, do you have any advice for people applying to do classics? Um, I think I would really stress to find out what you're passionate about because there is so much to classics. It's so interdisciplinary that. Actually, if you have something that you're passionate about and that you can talk about, it will lead you on to, to find out about other things. Um, but as someone who just like fell in love with Latin and Greek, um, I would just, just, I don't know, for, like, fall in love with the subject because if not, like, the tutors can kind of see through that. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, I think it's been better than I imagined. I thought I was going to have to write four essays a week and I thought it was going to be terrible and that um, I'd be confronted with parts of Latin grammar that, I, that I'd never seen before. Um, and to a certain extent, that's true. I do have get confronted with parts of grammar that I've never seen before. Um, but. I don't have four essays a week and um, <clears throat> actually it's not as scary as I thought it would be. Um, the tutors are lovely <laughs> um, and there is, there's a really nice balance between doing language and doing literature and actually it's manageable and it reminded me so much more of why I really enjoy doing classics. Yeah.